Uh, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the International Documentaries Fall Screening Series. My name is Cassidy Diamond, and I am the Public Programs and Events Manager here at the International Documentary Association. So glad to have you. Uh, just wanted to start out uh, this conversation around the painter and the thief, which we're very excited about. Um, with, with a land acknowledgement as we do for all of our events. So um, today I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, which is on the unceded land of the Tongva and Chumash people who have been stewards of this, of this land for generations. I would also like to um, thank our media sponsor, IndieWire, for their support. And uh, the screening series is also brought to you with support from KCRW. Um, so just to get us started, um, you can find out more about our films and our uh, conversations at documentary.org slash screening series. Okay, and thank you. And I'd like to introduce um, Eric Cohn from IndieWire who will start this conversation. Hi, thanks for having me. As you can see, I, I love this movie enough that I'm still living in its world. And uh, it, what's so thrilling to me about it is that it's it's just it's not only an emotional experience to watch this film, but it's an entirely unpredictable one, which is why many of us go to the movies in the first place. So I'm very excited to talk to both the filmmaker uh, behind this movie as well as its subjects about how they feel. The, the, the film portrays what, what they went through in this incredible journey. So um, I'm, I'd like to welcome filmmaker Benjamin Ree, as well as subject Carl Bertil Nordenlund. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much for having us. I believe we'll also have Barbara Kisilkova. At some point, she's in the woods with sketchy internet connections and so forth. So hopefully she'll join us at some point during this conversation. But I want to get into uh, the genesis of this project with you, uh, Benjamin, because it's, um, it's such a fascinating journey from start to finish. And I wondered at what point you realized the kind of film that you were making here. Uh it all started out as a short documentary, actually. I read about this uh, story, and it was on the front newspapers in Norway. And I began to make a 10-minute short documentary. I thought that the kind of premise for this film was really fascinating. But at that time, back in 2016, I did not know anything where this story might end up, what would happen. Um, and then... Um, we also had a lot of archival footage there. So um, a friend of Barbara had documented her art life, taking photos of her paintings being made. Um, she had also filmed the exhibition. We had surveillance cameras uh, with the thieves stealing the paintings. We uh, also had actual court uh, recordings uh, when uh, Barbara approached Carl Bertil uh, to ask if uh, uh, she could paint him. Uh, so, so when I began filming, I. I did not know anything uh, where the story might end up, but what kind of changed this uh, from a short film to become a longer format film was the scene um, where Carl Bakil sees himself painted for the first time. And his reaction to that um, was just extraordinary to, to, to observe. Uh, and, and then we knew that this is not going to be a short documentary anymore. So, Carl Broto, given that that scene was sort of a turning point for the making of this film, what was it like for you to, to sort of recognize that you were now a character in this project that somebody wanted to make about you? Could you hear that? to see here if we can have that i'll give you the question again can you hear me okay yeah hmm. sorry so, about Carl, that. no problem but so the question was that i that i would have for you about all this is given that the turning point in the in for benjamin in terms of making the film was was that moment what was it like for you to realize that you were the character in the story that someone was telling hmm. um 
it's kind of absurd being being uh, an object of a movie, uh, being where I was in my life at that time, being at a, at a, at a such low. Uh, but my focus was on, I had, a, I had opportunity to tell a story that not many people could uh, or, or would uh, about hope. And, uh, and I had to remind myself many times that uh, I, I was telling a story and it, uh, and it was an important story to tell. Um, uh, Benjamin, maybe you could tell us a bit about how the, the project evolved once you realized that it was going to be a feature because there are moments in this film that it almost feels like we're watching some, a, a scripted narrative, the way that it unfolds. How, how much footage did you have to kind of capture in order to feel like you had enough to assemble what we've seen here? We uh, had uh, about 100 recording days, and that gave us about 350 hours of, of footage. Um, and yeah, it, it was, of course, a big question. How shall we kind of structure this? How shall we edit uh, this film? Uh, and the first choice we took quite early on, that was um, we wanted to portray also Carl Bakke as the intelligent, charismatic, a funny guy and he is. We wanted to portray him as a complex person. And we thought that the only way to do that was to show the world from his point of view. So that was why we began filming his, uh, his perspectives quite, quite early on. And I think that dramaturgy in documentary is not only an artistic choice, it's also an ethical choice because we're portraying real people. They have to live with this film uh, the rest of their lives. And then it's very important for that portrayal, I think, uh, to be uh, nuanced and representative. Uh, so that was uh, one of the main reasons why we ch choose to kind of change perspectives here. Um, and then the next kind of thing we did was to try to, like, what is this film really about? And that goes back to the scene that changed everything, where Carl Bakke sees himself painted. Um, and, uh, and for me, the film is about what we humans do in order to be seen and appreciated and what it takes of us to see others and, and help others. And since the film is ex are exploring those themes, I thought it was fun also to jump back and forth in time. So we had overlapping scenes, uh, seen from both Barbara's perspective and then also Bakke's perspective. But that we found out uh, in the editing room, actually, uh, to have overlapping scenes. And I haven't seen that in a documentary before. Uh, and I thought that was fun to try out. Uh, and that also, of course, makes the film self-reflective because that forces uh, the audience to become an active watcher. And it forces the audience to think about the actual filmmaking process. Uh, how does, like, how does actually having a camera present here in both Barbara and Kolbaki's lives uh, affect their, their lives and their choices. Of course it has an effect. I don't believe it's a fly on the wall. <laughs> We're not that um, invisible. So uh, I think that was also uh, uh, a challenge that was fun to try something new with the documentary genre to make itself reflective with jumping back and forth in time. Well, Barbara Kisilkova, welcome. It's good to have you as a part of this conversation, especially at this moment because we're, we've been talking about the process of getting the camera involved in this story and how much the camera needed to be there to capture every step of the way. Now we see you go through such a remarkable journey in this movie. What was it about the presence of the camera that you felt was um, important to have there? I mean, what, what, what value did, did letting the camera into your life have for you at that time? First of all, I don't know if the sound is okay with me. Mm, no. Oh. It's uh, the So you don't hear me? I, I can hear you now. Now you can. Okay, I'm sorry because I dropped off uh, just computers, you know, the strange universe. So how? what did the camera do to me, if that's what you asked? Okay. Mm, yeah, I was uh, you know, I had the cameras kind of everywhere. 
uh, you know, we are observed and we sort of, I mean, somehow the performance might become more of our daily life, uh, want it or not. But of course, it's something else that uh, there is a, a concrete person following us for um, quite intensive time and to have the presence of a third person in my working space or something from I don't know me or how I I just hope that I managed to get through the the most natural me as possible. And let's have you turn the camera off so that we can get a slightly better Wi-Fi connection if possible. It might be easier for just the audio instead of the video. Okay. And while you're doing that, I'm going to ask, I have another question for you about that, because I think it's also notable that over the course of this film, we, we see you struggle with your own artwork. And um, I wonder what you get from watching the film now, um, ha having some distance from the amount of time that it captures. I have watched the movie only once fully, and that was in the world premiere at Sundance. Um, there is some sort of vanity that I have that I think we all have, which is like uh, some issues with either watching yourself or hearing yourself that uh, is not easy bite to chew. Um, I never struggled with my artwork or I mean, of course, it is a constant struggle with the work itself, but that's something else. I think what you refer to is uh, my kind of existential struggle, yeah. uh, like money-wise and so on. Um, that's, you know, that sort of eternal fight of uh, whatever creative profession, I think. <laughs> well, I, I'll put the same question then to Caro Bertil. I mean, what is the experience like for you watching the film now? Uh, I've also seen the film only once <laughs> <laughs> on a small computer, and I don't want to see it again. Uh, uh, it's no problem to 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 watch myself. Uh, I don't have I don't feel that much vanity when looking at myself. But but it's hard for me to go back to where I was then to see the pain, the addiction, and to see how low I was. That's it's that hurts me. So I don't I don't feel the need to go back there anymore. I would like to. Uh say something about about battle that's uh, i think also important uh, uh to know and that is uh the tr kind of the journey battle is on in the film from being at this lowest point to where he is today uh, for me that's the most extraordinary thing i've ever experienced and i have to brag a bit about your back in <laughs> uh you, you, you're not counting kind of months of being sober counting years um uh, which is extraordinary uh and i'm very very proud of you. You you you've finished second year at the uh, school of sports science. You've got a, a job, and quite recently you, you asked me what does actually a normal person do at an office. <laughs> uh, I don't know the the answer to that, but um, I, I think I think it's a really extraordinary accomplishment what Bakel has achieved uh, by both you know, physically and mentally getting where he is today. And that, that's great to hear. Barbara, what, what, did, what did you think was going to happen as you went through this experience with, with him in terms of, um, you know, starting at a point in time where, you know, somebody's life was, was sort of in shambles? What, what did you think was, was going to happen? Because we see so many different points in time where it's not really clear um, how things are going to turn out. Well, I think in life, it's never clear how things will turn out, you know. Uh, shall there be camera around or not? It's just life has its paths. And so therefore I tried to not to have any expectations or I did not really go there to, to try to find answer to this question that you have now um, brought up. But of course, what I can tell you is my motivation to, what was my motivation to uh, agree with this project for me was I really felt the strong potential in Bertil's story. And I wanted to 
show to people what might happen when we put aside any prejudices that we can carry towards each other and um, what happens when you just sit down with the person and you talk like human to human. So that, uh, that was my motivation to start the project. And I'm really, really glad to see that the message sort of got through. Mm -hmm. Well, off of that, I, I want to ask all three of you about what we don't see in the film. What kind of conversations took place when the camera wasn't rolling and, uh, you know, how that sort of informed the way the, pro the project uh, moved along? Maybe, Benjamin, you can start off. We had a lot of conversations, um, of course, and I think that with this film, uh, we talked a lot about filmmaking, and uh, I tried to give them a quick dramaturgy course, <laughs> uh, and I think that to involve both um, and include both Barbara and Kalbakil in the filmmaking process, that makes it easier for them to understand why we're filming certain scenes, why it's important, and that also made it possible for them to contact me. So, for example, when Carl Bakkel is going to rehab, he is the one that contacts me uh, to film that scene. Uh, and we had all kinds of conversations. Maybe the kind of toughest conversations was about kind of... Um, uh, Bakkel almost dying uh, during filming, and we talked about it. Um, and uh, I remember I, I told Bakkel that if you die, we're not going to make a film. We're not going to make a film about it. Um, but do you remember what what you responded to to that? Yeah, of course, of course, we're you're going to make a film, even if I die. It would be a good movie, even then. Mm. So, so uh, uh, these were some, kind of some of the conversations we had. And and for example, this, this scene again when Kabakil is going to Riyadh, he is the one that contacts me. And the, the reason he does that is because we talked a lot about we wanted to portray drugs when the party is over, like the brutal, almost truth about drugs. Um, and and on the way back in, on the way to rehabilitation, he buys heroin. His then girlfriend takes it away from him, and he begs to get it back. And the day after we shot that scene, Bakil called me up and said, you can't use that in the film. You can't use that scene in the film. Um, and I responded to that with, with saying that um, I respect that. Uh, we, we're not going to use it in the film. I think it's certainly kind of ethical responsibilities when you film someone that's on drugs, then they need to have the chance to kind of when they're sober to, 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 to change their minds. And the day after that again, but he called me up and he said, uh, you have to use it in the film. It's so important to show. And from that day on, he, he stayed with that view. So that, there's a, kind of, a few examples of some of the conversations we're having that's not on camera, but, uh, but, but, but that's also important for the filmmaking process and the trust we're building while filming it. Well, Barbara, what about you? Were there ever moments where you had reservations about revealing aspects of your life on camera? Um, I really need to emphasize on what Benjamin said now at the end, and that is to build the trust. Um, you know, for me, this was, of course, totally new experience. I think for Bertil as well, that somebody would follow us on quite a daily, daily uh, schedule. So there really had to be trust built um, from us towards Benjamin and it just went so easy. I mean, if you look at this guy, he, you know, he looks like this young, uh, cool Scandinavian Viking, but he's such a, he's such a big heart and such sensitive person that, uh, I really have met very seldom of such type of people. So the trust for me was very uh, essential. And I, you probably might guess in the movie, not at all comparable my life journey uh, to Bertil's of what we see in the film. I mean, I was basically just inert standing at the studio and painting. So there's not much I would like to hide except of myself from the world. <laughs> but the world came in to my studio. And so, no, I never had any any moments where I would uh, think, think or feel of uh, 
withdrawing from it, not at all. And I'm really, really glad that um, Bertil managed to walk all the way until the nice, sweet end as well. Well, Berto, I want to uh, throw this back to you because it's it's fascinating hearing Benjamin talk about you know your commitment to have the film made no matter what happened to you. But what was it for you at that time that made you feel so strongly that the film needed to exist? Um, uh, because I had uh, the opportunity to to uh, show to tell a story that no that not many people. I uh, could uh, about how how bad it gets when when the party is over and all you're left with is your own shame and anxiety and heavy drug abuse. What has it been like for you to talk to other people who watch the film, either people who know you or uh, audiences who who don't? Uh, it helps me. It's it's a lot of therapy for me. Because uh, it it helps me to like own my own story. Uh, I can I can sit with people after they they've seen the film, uh, and and know that I'm good enough. Uh, I'm I don't have to wear any masks. Uh, I'm good enough as I am. It helps me a lot. That's great to hear. And, and Barbara, can you tell us a bit about? how things have been going for you since the film was completed. I mean, the world has changed in, in dramatic ways, but it's also, you know, it's been some time since uh, since the completion of the film overall. So maybe you can give us a, a bit of an update. Well, I have to admit uh, that despite all the corona uh, ruling the world today, I'm actually living life that I think I would be having anyway, even if corona formed different planets to occupy, meaning I'm, you know, with my boyfriend in the forest, in my atelier working. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it's, um, of course, it's just, it's a bit more difficult to, to travel around. So we don't really see uh, much each other now with Bertel because Sweden is um, sort of a red listed country. So I can't really travel. I can't really go to my hometown, to Prague, Czech Republic to see my family. So that's a little bit, uh, yeah, sad. But otherwise, you know, it's uh, also one positive aspect in my opinion about that the cinemas have been shut down, festivals canceled, but how fast the world of, let's say movie, if we speak concretely now about the movie world has adjusted so fast and so wonderfully that the movies are available online. And I think it also makes so many more people being able to see either our movie or whatever movie, you know, because no, not everybody is willing to leave their living room and go to a cinema. But once the cinema comes to your home, I think it's... Uh... So there's one very nice positive aspect, I think, of this whole misery. Well, and the, the film also captures your artistry. Has it led to any future conversations about other work you might produce? You mean what I'm working on, or? Yeah, I mean, or, or I mean, is it is it helping you find? Uh, has anyone commissioned anything off of the documentary? So this is a total avalanche, which really uh, comes to the forest like a very strange creature, and that is my email is really flooded by so many messages and so many people. I'm I, I'm sure that Bertel's messages also uh, appear on daily basis from new and new people who either want to express their gratitude or thankfulness for the story. Some people express their um, uh, amazement over my work, my art uh, work, and some people even ask uh, whether they can purchase. So I have uh, gladly learned how to use UPS and I have sent several paintings over to USA, which uh, now these paintings found their new homes across the United States. And of course, this is a wonderful feeling. But I'm now a little bit struggling because there are so many urgent new paintings I need to make of Bertil. But uh, since we cannot really meet and we don't meet due to his busy journeys and me being locked up in Sweden, it's a little bit uh, painful for me that I can't let new material, get new material for new paintings of Bertel. 
Well, Berto, what, what is, uh, we got, we heard a little bit from Benjamin about this, but what is your life like now? How are you, how are you doing? Uh, I'm sober. That's the most important thing. <laughs> Still sober. Uh, and the second most important is I'm a full-time student. Uh, I study sport medicine at the university in Oslo, sports science. Uh, so that, that, that's my, that's what I, I, I prioritize. Uh, but um, I also got a job at uh, a couple of weeks ago at the Blue Cross. So I use uh, the film um, to uh, talk. I'm going to into prisons the, in Halden Prison, uh, the prison I was in in the movie, uh, to talk to the inmates and giving some hope back to them. That's a really big step for me. Um, also going to other prisons, other country, and other other cities, um, uh, and since I'm studying sport medicine, uh, my work is um, uh, in the Blue Cross is uh, for uh, building a project around uh, around uh, training uh, for uh, people that are coming out of prisons and uh, I've been to rehabilitation for drugs, so. I'm, I'm a busy man these days. <laughs> you also receive a lot of messages, right? Like about that. Yeah, especially when the when the film launched in uh, at Hulu in America, uh, I got a lot of messages. Uh, now it's uh, uh, so it's a bit more less these days. Hmm. Well, uh, Benjamin, for uh, given all all that's happened as a result of this film and in, in the lives of your subjects. Can you tell us a bit about when you knew you had an ending? A lot of times documentary filmmakers feel like they, they, they talk about when they found their ending. Did you have an ending in mind while you were shooting the film? I knew I had the ending when Barbara found uh, the swan song, the missing painting. So the film opens with that painting being stolen together with another painting. Uh, and it felt very natural to end the film with Carl Bakhti that stole that painting, putting it back on the canvas again. I thought that was like the, the circle was fulfilled in a way. Um, so that's when I knew I had an ending, when we found the painting and they put it back on the frame together. I thought that was a very beautiful scene. Um, and then we also have a reveal, uh, the, the last shot of the film, of course, uh, which I think is... Uh, that painting kind of summarizes the, the film in many ways. It's a really beautiful, extraordinary work by, by Buddha. And, and that also makes the audience uh, think a bit more about, about what they've been watching so far. It's also fascinating to think about how you made this story on their lives while they were experiencing it, because those are two different things. One is what you want to create as a filmmaker, and the other is the actual journey that they're on. So. Just how much were you willing to invite them into what you were capturing and how you were choosing to structure their story as you were filming it? I hope I was included in that process, uh, but I, but I all, I'm also a bit nervous <coughs> to talk a bit more <laughs> too much about <laughs> filmmakers. <laughs> I'm a big film geek, so I don't know if uh, Carl Bakke and Barbara appreciated me <laughs> mentioning Victor Sjöström and Vital, <laughs> for example. Um, I hope I was uh, invited them into that process. And both of them got to see the film in kind of an early edit, early drafts to get the comments on it. And they saw it, the final film once um, after that. Uh, but but I, I love to talk about filmmaking. Like I, I love to talk about the process. And I, I also think it's important for me to talk about this with Barbora and Carl Bakker. I don't know. Do, do, do you feel that I, I have talked too much about uh, filmmaking or how's that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can follow you on some of it, but when it's going into black and white movies, then I jump out. Yeah. Okay. Well, I had I a very nice backup actually of my boyfriend of Oystein when Benjamin was talking about this film nerdy thing because Oystein is also a total film nerd. So I just sort of observed these two people talking and I just withdrew into my world and got my entertainment from watching these two guys yeah. talking. And who is Victor Sjöström? Do you know? Well, well I'll come back to you. Who's Victor Sjöström? I know who is Andrei Tarkovsky and that's fine for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Well, Tarkovsky is certainly not who I would think about while watching this film. Benjamin, what kind of filmic re- reference points were you, uh, did you have in mind? Tarkovsky isn't the reference point, but I think that's a reference point for Vladimir's painting. <laughs> by Tarkovsky. I love Tarkovsky's movies, but uh, it's not the inspiration for this film. Um, for this film, uh, I think like <laughs> A Man with a Movie Camera, that's a film that has been inspired in me uh, for, for many years. Also kind of the, the opening <laughs> titles of that film, where it kind of states what uh, a cinematic language is and what they're trying to do. And the way that is inspiring for this film is that I do a lot of interviews in the film all the time uh, to know what Barbara and Kalbakil are feeling. Uh, and then it's my job to use those interviews and, and find a cinematic language to convey it. Usually in documentaries, uh, we use those interviews. Uh, and I've made a lot of documentaries in that way also, but here we have a chance to use those interviews and, and re- like remove it fr- from the edit but use it to find the cinematic language to, 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 to show it, really, to show it. Um, for example, when Carl Wackel is in prison, um, he talks about isolation, he talks about how repetitive it is, uh, and he talks about um, how lonely it is. And then it's my job to find a form to convey that emotion. And then I also need to use myself, because I, have, I haven't been to prison, but I've experienced similar emotions. And for example, then in that scene, we, we, we use inspirations from uh, Sam picking past the getaway, for example, the opening of that film. So we use a lot of inspirations to find a form to convey the, the emotions uh, back in the are describing. And that's also why Man with a Movie Camera is a great inspiration, because that's a film that really found a form uh, to a content. And yeah, that's something we've been, now he's, uh, <laughs> he's bored, <laughs> he's already bored. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you can go with the next question, Eric. <laughs> well, the next question I would have for you is, is, is very different because uh, I think that uh, there's, it's worth pointing out that this film is sort of uh, a portal into Norwegian society for those of us who may not be incredibly familiar with it, specifically uh, because you know, as an American watching this film, you see you see aspects of a world that is very different from the one we live in. I think specifically about the prisons uh, would seem much nicer than our own, but perhaps uh, this is uh, uh, this is uh, something you could help clarify for us a bit. Uh, just how much do you think this film is sort of a reflection of Norwegian society as a whole? Is that the question for me or call back in? Yeah, for you, and then we'll go to Bako from there. Uh, we were very fortunate uh, with the film that we got access to film in a Norwegian prison. And of course, there's a difference uh, with the Norwegian prisons compared to, for example, in the US. Um, it's much more focused on rehabilitation um, than punishing. And I think that a lot of people that are in prison, they they have, have a lot of struggles. So like um, uh, drug related problems, psychological problems. So to, to focus on the re- rehabilitation, I think it's very good. And I also think that increases the chances when you get out of prison. But I also know uh, from talking to Bakke a lot about this, that in prison, uh, anywhere in the world you're in prison, your freedom is removed away from you. And that is a terrible feeling. And I think I don't want to kind of explain this. I have have someone that really knows about this. I think that maybe come back. You can say a bit about how how that is like. Yeah. Uh, I I used to uh, to talk about uh, uh, the book of the dead by Dostoevsky when he describes um, his uh, stay in Siberia in the 1860s, and uh, and and that book uh, describes how 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 people what happens to people when their freedom are taken away and and that is the same thing that happens in a Norwegian prison in 2020 uh, your, your freedom are taken away if you have a shower in your cell so what uh, of course uh, the system is uh, I think it they are trying to to be more humane uh, the Norwegian standard 
maybe the European standard more humane than what we see from America. But still, your freedom are taken, and that's uh, th that's where the punishment is. Do, do you I feel, feel like the, the system works? I mean, did did, did you feel like it was a po mostly a positive impact for you? Uh, I think the the idea is very good, but also in Norway, uh, it it's it uh, uh, the money restricts it. It's uh, if it if they had more money, they could do a lot more with the with the system that they're trying to build. Uh, I'm not sober today because of the prison. Uh, I got the distance from from the drugs in prison. Um, but uh, I think the punishment is the same when you when you take away your freedom. I feel when I when I see things from America and how you think and how how the society works there, it feels for us Norwegians, it's like you are living in the 1950s. Huh. Well, that that's a fascinating observation in light of what we see you go through in the film and. Unfortunately, Barbara had to leave, but um, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, Bako, also about uh, the way in which she sort of saw you as a subject in the film. Uh, given how much she was sort of fascinated by you and wanting to paint you, um, when you think back to that, how do, how do you feel about being sort of the subject of somebody's interests, of somebody's obsession like that, that, that particular moment in your life? Uh, when I first saw, when, on, on the film, when I saw my first painting, uh, it was uh, a deep feeling of being seen, uh, of, uh, of that Barbara took uh, something that miserable and so ugly and made it into, into this beautiful piece of art. Uh, but after, when, when I saw the movie, when the film was uh, was finished and I saw it, I could more then I could see uh, how she she focused on she found her um, uh, obsession or... obsession with my pain, uh, and I didn't see that during the filming. But uh, but uh, when when you see the uh, the scene from my from when I'm in hospital hospital and she comes to visit me and the only thing she's doing is uh, wanting to take picture of my scars. Mm. Well, Benjamin, uh, from your perspective, uh, I, I would be curious to know how this experience kind of changed you as a filmmaker because you captured something that seems to have had a direct impact on the lives of your subjects and also were able to follow them through the, the an entire chapter of their lives so where do you go from here in terms of your approach to, to storytelling i think i'll never make a film like this ever uh, again and the reason i'm saying that I, I don't think i will have kind of luck to find a story you know when you when you begin a documentary like this you don't know what kind of access you'll get and you don't know if it's going to happen anything in their lives really and there were so many turning points during the filming and they kept on saying yes to being filmed. I think that's that's very rare. For me, I think that's very, very rare. I've never experienced anything like that before with kind of that level of access and also so many turning points. Uh, so, uh, but, but, but also I think making this film has taught me a lot. This is my the first film I made where I uh, have taking some chances, like artistic chances. Uh, and, and that have given me some confidence, uh, but it's been a really difficult journey also. So I, I don't always have a really good confidence in myself, uh, but I think that uh, the film has given me a bit more confidence. I'm very, very self-critical and, and sometimes I have very, very, very low confidence. Uh, so, so I think that making this film and how people respond to it has given me a bit more confidence <laughs> in my filmmaking. Um, and I also, I, 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 to see kind of how people respond to the film has been amazing. And, 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 and Bakker receives messages every day and people use the film 
uh, to change their lives. Like one message Rebecca showed me quite recently that that's someone that's seen the, the film is have a severe drug problem. He's seen the film six times over a weekend and on Monday he goes to rehab and he writes to back it, I'm on rehab and then updates him on it. So many people use the film as a motivation uh, to change their lives and become sober. And I think to, to give that kind of hope, I think that's, for me, that's very, very valuable. Uh, and that will, of course, um, to, to see that that will also affect my uh, upcoming project. I, I think that um, to tell stories like it that, that can mean so much to others, I think I would, I would really like to continue doing that. Well, before we let you go, that leads to, I think, the inevitable question of where this story goes now, because one aspect of this conversation has really dug into how these two lives evolved after the camera stopped rolling. Is there a world in which we could see a, a sequel to The Painter and the Thief of sorts, as opposed to just talking about it? I think the answer to that is... We'll see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did not know what the uh, Bakker was going to say there. <laughs> I, I was going to say no, but uh, if Bakker says we'll see, then I think we'll see. <laughs> Michael Apted did the 7 Up series across decades. There's no reason why you can't follow a similar trajectory, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a great series. I think that uh, yeah, a lot of things are happening in both Bad Buddha and Michael Bakker's lives, and they're very intriguing, but I, I feel that. Uh, they've given me three years of their lives and it's a different kind of filmmaking than the up series because the up series they do a lot of interviews here and there like with the camera in so many situations all the time so i think that they deserve to be uh, have some relaxing years at, at least and, uh, and we'll see all right we'll wait a beat and come back to you on that one well, thanks again for being here. It's, it's a wonderful film and it's been a pleasure to talk to you both about it as well as to, to Barbara. Thanks again. Thank you so much for having us, uh, Eric and IBA. Thank you so much. Thank you.